Okay, so uh, tonight we're going to talk about dying having. Now, I, seem, I know that seems kind of like a dark. What? Yeah. What we're on? The, uh, the, the, the pastor is feeling restless because he didn't get to preach this morning, so I know. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, anyways, so now we're going to be talking about dying happy, which, which I know sounds like a dark idea, but I, I don't intend it to be that way. You know, as I, as I get older, I realize I'm not immortal. And, you know, once you transition from that child way of thinking that, you know, everything's always going to be the same to that adult way of thinking where you just start realizing... Well, people I know are dying, and you know this. This isn't what I signed up for. Where, where's the uh, Where's the revive button? You know, the restart or something. You know, and uh, you start thinking about death a lot, and then it gets to the point in your young years where it gets to the point of being unhealthy. Pretty much from your teens to like your thirties, all you can think about is death. And then you know you have your times then after. Um, in your fifties, it's very common, for instance. But it's just something that you think about a lot. And so for obvious reasons, I was reading through in Genesis 25, 8, and there's this, there's this passage that really sticks out. So that's what's going to be our, the basis of what we're looking at tonight is Genesis chapter 25, verse 8. Now, this passage reads differently in different translations. The NIV and the ESV don't really say it like this, um, but the NASB which in my opinion is more accurate anyways, uh, carries this idea over. Um, it says in 25.8, it says, Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man is satisfied with life. The NIV says that he, um, I don't remember exactly, something like um, he died full of years. But the NASB, I, I think, has a little bit of a better understanding of what's being said here. An old man is satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. Now, you know, like I said, you know, you, you start thinking about death a lot, and I, I know I'm not talking to myself here, everybody does it. And especially as we get older, we start seeing signs of our body decaying. You know, like we start having physical problems, we start waking up with aches and pains, we fall and we don't get over it in a day or two. You know, we just, we just start realizing that there's things that are different, you know, the, the, the mom and the dad bod that you can't get rid of, that kind of stuff. And it's just something that, 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 that is a constant reminder, and you, and you start feeling very restless, and you start thinking about death a lot, and you start asking yourself, have the things that I have done, or am doing, or will do, justify my existence on earth? And we know that we're not saved by works, but yet there's still a part of us that thinks, maybe, maybe if I can just make my existence worthwhile, or make, my, make God saving me worthwhile, that will somehow make me more ready for what's coming next. And so we're, we, we go through life in this pursuit of, of trying to be, trying to prove ourselves. And with Genesis, Abraham kind of breathes fresh air on this. And he says, no, you don't have to live like that. And this whole story of Abraham throughout Genesis really just catches my eye. So let's kind of delve in. Um, everyone dies, but Abraham's death was peaceful, and he was content. Which brings us to the question of, why? Why was Abraham's death peaceful? Why was he ready to go? Why was he content? Well, let's look at it. Not be, definitely not because his life was easy in any way, so let's look at a series of things. The first thing... It wasn't because he had everything, because Genesis 12.1 shows that he left everything. It says in Genesis 12, verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. So right there, he has to leave everything. So definitely we're not talking about something that was easy. You hop down to chapter 12, verse 10, and it says, now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. So he goes to this place that God tells him to go, and then there's a famine. Well, gee, thanks, God. So this happens quite a few times in his time in being in the promised land, or what would later be the promised land. 
So he faced difficulties. Okay, all right, well, well, maybe that's kind of the end of that. Well, no, not really. Now you go down to chapter 14, uh, verses 1 and 2. And it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, uh, Shinar Arak, king of Elsar, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, and Shinab, king of Adma, and Shimabar, king of Zeboim, and the king of Belta, that is Zoar. And it goes on talking about how these kings go to war with each other. And long story short, Abraham ends up having to go to war with them too. He has to, you know, they're, they're doing their own thing. He's not even connected with them, but he gets caught up into their war. So it wasn't because he had a, a life that was had no difficulties. He fought in war. So then we get down to 15.2. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Basically, someone who I'm not related to. So it wasn't because he didn't face this appointment. So then, we hop down to chapter 21, verses uh, 9 through 10. And you have to remember, Abraham didn't leave uh, Ur the city of Ur until he was in his 70s. So this is kind of a long pattern of just what seems to us as disastrous circumstances. So chapter 21, verse 9 through 10 says, Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. So he ends up having to part ways with his firstborn son, um, Isaac, sorry, Ishmael, his firstborn son, Ishmael, and later we find out that he has to send away his other sons too, so that the inheritance won't be split up, so that it only goes to Isaac. So here we see that he had a, he had a broken household too. Well, surely if my family was a normal family, surely everything then would be happy. Well, no, Abraham died peaceful and his, and his household was broken. So he died peacefully, even though he had to leave everything that he ever knew, even though he faced difficulties, even though he had to go to war, even though he had disappointments, even though he had a broken household, he still died peaceful. He was still content at the point of his death. So what is the deal here? Well, it keeps going here. You go to chapter 14, verse 21 through 23. After the battle with the kings, um, the king of Sodom comes to Abraham and he says this, Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom in verse 22, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal, a uh, thong, or anything that is yours. For fear you would say, I have made Abram rich. Now this seems to imply that Abram wasn't rich. Now obviously we know that Abraham wasn't poor, but the overemphasis that has been said in, in, in years past that Abraham was abundantly rich might be a little bit of an overstatement. In fact, when it's recording all the things that Abraham says, it says that he owns camels. Now, for a long time, people thought that the Old Testament was not historically reliable because they said, well, camels were not, um, what's it called, domesticated at this point in history. Well, they proved that that was not true. Abraham, uh, camels were domesticated from before the time of Moses, but here's the thing. I'm sorry, before the time of Abraham, but here's the thing. They weren't overly popular. Nobody really had camels. But yet, Genesis goes to, goes to mention that he owned camels as well. Which seems to imply that Abraham wasn't really super rich. He was just, he was okay. He was getting by. Why else would they mention camels? Uh, an insignificant animal. So then um, we see here in, uh, in, in, the, in this part here that he's not chasing wealth. See, I'm not even going to take this even though I deserve it because I don't want people to think that you made me rich in the future. So he's not chasing wealth even when he deserved to get the wealth. So we know that it is not neither the riches that made him happy and made him die happy or the striving for the riches that made him happy. In uh, chapter 15, verse 5, it says, And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And in chapter 17, verse 8 as well, he says, 
I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Okay? Which sounds good, except Abraham didn't get to see any of this. See, God gave him all these promises, and he never saw. He never saw Yahweh as his children's God. His son Isaac barely has any interest in Yahweh, it appears, throughout the text. And his grandson, who is then later named Israel, only had an interest in Yahweh after he had been living up in, 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 in the land of Haran and come down and all this stuff happens towards the end of Genesis. And it goes through all this process of his daughter getting raped and you know his, his father-in-law being unhappy. This whole long ordeal. And that's the first time we really see Israel having any real commitment to Yahweh. His sons, so Abraham's great-grandsons, seem almost entirely uninter uninterested in God except for Joseph. Joseph seems to be the exception to the rule. And so then, throughout the generations of them living in Egypt, you have a bunch of Israelites who aren't really that connected with their God. So we're talking about hundreds of years later that this promise is not fulfilled. By the time that Moses goes into Egypt to free the people of Israel, they're worshiping the Egyptian gods as well. They, they kind of know about Yahweh. They kind of know about the God of their fathers somewhere back there, but he's just another God to them. And it even says that in Exodus that when they cried out, it doesn't say they cried out to God. It just says they cried out from their pain, and God heard them. They didn't even, they weren't even walking with, clo with God close enough to call out to him just to complain about their situation. Luckily, <laughs> God is merciful enough to hear and lift them up in the middle of that anyways. Um, so he doesn't see the fulfillment. So again, we're, we, we keep finding in, in, in the life of Abraham nothing but excuses for him to not be happy. Yet it says very specifically about how he died peaceful. He was content. He was ready. He was triumphant in his death. Now, how the heck was he triumphant in his death when he didn't have triumph in his life? He never took any of the land of Canaan, what would be the promised land, by force. In fact, in chapter 23, verses 8 through 9, And he spoke with them, saying, If it is your wish for me to bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and approach Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns, which is at the end of his field, for the full price. Let him give it to me in your presence for a burial site. Here we have the story of Abraham buying a plot of land to, to bury his wife in, who has died. And he doesn't take it by force. When he went to war with those kings that I mentioned earlier, he never once took a piece of land. Conquerors take land. Abraham didn't take any of it. And then he bought the land that God had already promised him rather than just taking it. He never once took any of the land by force. In fact, that's a theme that goes throughout. His son Isaac is digging a bunch of wells, and people keep messing with him, so he keeps moving and digging more wells, and he never once goes to war with the people of the land. Even though, by right, it, that land was supposed to go to him. So we have them not taking the, the land by force. And then chapter 25, verse 5 through 6. Now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son uh, Isaac eastward to the land of the east. So here we also have he didn't substitute the promise. He knew that the promise was for his son Isaac, not, not for anyone else, and he made sure to stick with that. Now people would say, well, didn't he marry Hagar? Didn't he have sex with Hagar? and get his firstborn son Ishmael. Yes, but under the law of Ur, where he came from, that was actually a common practice. That was, that was what you did. If your wife did not produce, you took your wife's um, servant, basically, for long story short, and she would father you a child, or I'm sorry, mother you, would, uh, she would bear you a child, and that child would be counted as the child of your actual wife. That was the law of the land. So Abraham didn't do that out of disobedience to God. He did that out of following the laws of the land. 
just like you pay taxes. Well, are you saying that you don't trust God because you pay taxes? No, I'm following the law of the land. That's what Abraham was doing. He was following the law of the land. I want to emphasize that because people kind of run wild with the whole Abraham didn't trust in the promise. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. He was following the law. Now, anyways, so that takes us to the idea of happiness, dying, dying happy. Did you notice that it's kind of a paradox to try and be happy? The more you try and be happy, the less happy you are. It's like Will Smith came out with that movie, The Pursuit of Happiness. And oh, what are we on up there? Okay, yeah, we're there. Okay, good. Uh, you know, it's that idea that we have where I'm, I'm trying to be happy. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find happiness. Well, not if you're looking for it. Happiness isn't something you can attain. It's a byproduct. It's a consequence. So what is the action that has to be taken to receive that consequence? I think that Abraham shows us But before I go on, I want to emphasize here, happiness cannot be attained by trying to be happy nor through everything going right. It can't be attained by no problems. Some things guarantee you won't be happy. Now, I do want to say this before we talk about how you can be, be happy. First off, not working. If, especially as, I don't know about women, but as a man, if you don't have a job and you just kind of live at home and don't do anything, you're not working towards anything, you're not going to be happy. There's just a certain part of a man that's not wired to sit around doing nothing. I, I, I can't explain it. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I've, been, I've been a hard worker before, and I've not worked before. I've done both. And when you don't work, you, you're not going to feel happy. You, there's just something inside of you that just, you just got to get out there. But then there's, there's, other, there's more that will guarantee you are not happy. Any kind of um, entertainment 24-7, playing too many video games, watching too much TV, that kind of stuff. Too much of, um, of entertainment. Things that entertain when, when they're taken too much is, is really bad. In fact, they're, they're doing a lot of studies recently that are, that are linking smartphones with depression. And they're linking uh, things with, with children not paying attention, not being able to concentrate and stuff with tablet devices and that kind of stuff. Where we're finding that the more technology we create, <laughs> the more we got to be careful with the technology we created. <laughs> um, I mean, look at all these uh, violent video games that are coming out, where, where you know that people with autism or whatnot are, are playing, and it's and it's not good for them because they're not being able to distinguish between reality and, and fake. Um, in fact, a lot of doctors are giving warnings that um, if you read some video games warnings on them, they will say. Um, if you far, start feeling disillusioned or distant from reality or, you know, go through all these different things, stop playing immediately. And that usually is a sign of playing for more than an hour or two. <laughs> you know, and this is something that, that, that is affecting us. But these kinds of things will not make us happy. Camping out on social media. I see a lot of people spending their entire day on Facebook and they're just never happy. And they don't work, they sit at home on Facebook all day and they say about how unhappy they are. Then they post on Facebook about how they're unhappy so that other people can tell them, no, it's okay. And then if they don't respond how they want them to respond, then they feel you know, even more bad. And it's just a, a, an endless cycle of pointlessness. So let me just save you the time. This is what you're gonna find on social media. You're gonna find people ranting and you're gonna find uh, people making fun of other people you're gonna find a lot of ir irrelevant pictures and videos, basically a waste of time, which is okay. You know, everybody has little things that they waste their time on, but there is life outside of social media, outside of entertainment, outside of video games, outside of our phones, outside of everything. I, uh, I actually have a rule for the young adults where they have to bring a physical copy of their Bible. They can't bring the Bible on their phone because I, I'm trying to teach them the idea of your time with God is not separated, like, your, your phone, you use it for a lot of different things, right? And when you're spending time with God, you get in the mindset of, I'm not here to do this and that, I'm here to do this. So whenever they bring their physical copy of their Bible, um, I give them extra award points for the section. Um, not forgiving people. This is something that you will never be happy if you're not forgiving people. Um, living for yourself, doing whatever you want, doing whatever you please, 
The idea of just seeking after pleasure. See, the more pleasure you partake of, the less you enjoy that pleasure. So then you try and do more stuff that's pleasurable so that you feel better, but then you enjoy it less. So you get in the cycle of doing nothing but things that, that, that used to provide you pleasure, but you don't find joy in any of those things anymore. Uh, and they're actually saying that my generation is the most depressed generation that is alive today, even above the senior citizens that are alive today. And you have, you have to ask why. Well, there's a lot of different factors, and I don't want to oversimplify it, but one thing is, is the idea of them feeling disconnected. That's one piece of the puzzle. I'm not trying to oversimplify it. Okay? I know it's more complicated than that. So we, so we get to this constant, constant nagging question, how do I be happy in a culture that is always trying to be happy but never actually being happy? Happiness is a byproduct of two main things that I want to focus on today. The first one is obedience. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, It says, so Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. In chapter 22, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Now it says there, your only son. This is actually the same word that is used uh, in regards to Jesus. This was not Abraham's only son. It's, the word is actually more specifically translated, your special son. The, the one who has the promise. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the uh, mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Now remember, God, Abraham didn't have a Bible. He didn't know all of what God was like. See, we know that God doesn't delight in burnt sacrifices, even more so of human beings, because humans were made in the image of God. That puts them above everything else. We know that. Abraham evidently didn't know that. But he knew that God could raise the dead. He didn't understand what was happening, but he went. God told him to leave his homeland. He didn't understand what was happening, but he went. And then another verse here is in uh, verses 10 through 14. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called down from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now, I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And you might ask, well, doesn't God know everything? Yes, but a choice cannot exist in a vacuum. If God never gives you the opportunity to obey, you never actually can obey. Think about it. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket of his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt sacrifice in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, and the mount of the Lord will be provided. So the first thing that causes happiness is obedience to God. When he tells you to do something, you do it. But what if God tells me to do something I won't like? Count on it. We talked about this in Young Adults. Count on God calling you to do something that you won't like. And the more you let yourself die, the more you'll enjoy it, and the more you'll be changed into the image and the glory of God. Amen. There's a process. You don't wake up one day and say, yes, God, I want to give up my life of happiness and go into the mission field. Why would I want to do that? See, I mean, it's not something you just wake up one day and say, yes, I want to go and deal with a bunch of other people's problems. Yeah. Nobody's going to say that. But when God puts a calling on your life and you obey, the pleasure that he gives you in that is greater, although it takes longer, than any other pleasure you can find. So the second thing that causes happiness is trust. In chapter 15, verse 6, Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned him as righteousness. And in chapter 18, verse 22 through 25. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. 
Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all of the earth deal justly? He trusted in God, although he had no proof for trusting in God. He trusted in God through all these different things. And you know, in our, in our, in our natural, natural understanding, sometimes we, we fill in the gaps where we shouldn't. Abraham was following the law and had a child through his, through his wife's servant, Hagar. Now, in Abraham's understanding, while I'm following the law, this must be what God meant. And if you notice, God then specifies his promise. After Ishmael is born, God says very specifically, no, 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 I'm going to give you a son through Sarah. He specifies so that Abraham knows, I'm doing something above and beyond what the law calls for. So, in closing, we're going to look at just a few passages that I think really summarize what I've been talking about. The first is in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 3. If I can turn to it. It says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. So basically, what Peter just said is, everything that you're building, everything that you're striving for, God is going to follow after you and burn it. Well, I, I really want to. I really want to remodel my house. I really want to. Those things are fine. That's fine. But don't don't get carried away with those things, because God is going to come after you finish that remodel, after you finish building your great enterprises, and He's going to burn it all. Everything we are working towards in this physical life is going to be burned away. It's not going to be lasting. You know, as a man, I don't once again, I can't speak for the women, but as a man, we like to think that we're going to do something that, that leaves a mark on this world. You don't leave a mark on the world, you leave a mark on people. Exactly, exactly what my mom said this morning. I was going to smack her because she started preaching my sermon before tonight. And I was like, Mom, stop talking. It's exactly what I was going to say. Absolutely exactly what I was going to say. You build people, not things. Because everything that we are building will be burned up after us. Everything we have will be burned up after us. God is literally going to follow. This just blows my mind. This blows my mind. People who build skyscrapers, who have these huge empires, God is going to follow after us and burn it. Well, that suddenly puts that big thing that we thought was so important in perspective. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6-7. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when, accom when uh, accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. Being content. That's exactly when you find that contentment in Christ rather than trying to be happy, you will be happy. It kind of sounds like it doesn't make sense until you do it, and then it makes sense. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-17 through 17 says this, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passed away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Likewise, in Isaiah chapter 58, and this is going to be the last one I look at tonight. I think that this one is just unbelievably powerful. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 9 through 11. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and you will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness, and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones, and you will be like a watered garden. You just have to, you just have to look out for yourself, right? Isn't that what everybody's always saying? You've got to do what's good for you. 
You, you got to get away from destructive people. You've got you've got to you've got to spend your life just for yourself, just trying to be happy. That's exactly the opposite of what the prophet just said. If you want to be happy, God Himself will make you happy when you give yourself for others. If you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. Did you know that there are more slaves today than there ever have ever been? If you give yourself for the afflicted and give strength to your bones and you will be like a water garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. To give you an image of what he's talking about here, go out into the desert out here and try and find a beautiful flower bed. It doesn't exist. Now go into the original 49 over here and look at one of those retired people who, they have nothing better to do with their time. They literally sit there gardening all day. Look at how great their yards look. He will make you like a watered garden. Perfect, perfect analogy. Now, I'm, happiness is not found in indulging in pleasure, but sacrificing yourself for God. Now, I do want to clarify that. Some people walk around like they've been beaten all day, and they try to make everybody else happy. They try to, they try to live for everyone else. And when they're rejected by people, they just go to shreds. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sacrificing yourself for God and for his purposes. And when you, when you, when you do things for God, you won't... I really have to watch out how I say this. You, you won't need the justification of man. But you will do things that benefit people. And you will genuinely love people. Those things will follow. But if you make your whole life about getting people to like you, it will never be attained. So that's really where I want to end off there. That's, that's the biblical image of, of how we can know that we're headed in the right direction. Obeying God and trusting Him. And when our time comes, God will prepare our hearts for it. But right now is not our time to die. Right now is our time to fight. We are called to obey and to trust. And when the time comes, God will prepare us for the road that is at our feet. He's not going to prepare you for something that you're not at yet, though. So, with that, can I have... Uh, Chuck, would you mind closing us in prayer?